Hello, thank you for joining me today. I think we have a very exciting program and here's why. Because you see one of the most exciting times of the year in Israel is their new year. They call it Rosh Hashanah. But it also coincides with the religious holiday and that's the Feast of Trumpets. I don't think there could be a more exciting day if you were in Israel than the day that we're in right now. Matter of fact, what's interesting is that the celebration, some people record that it goes for three days and others for five. And I even found an article recently that said 25 days to celebrate it. That's quite a New Year's celebration. But to me, the importance of it is the fact that it's really the religious Feast of Trumpets. You see, just like in any society, there's both a religious day and there's a, a civil day. And so the, the civil day is indeed the, the New Year, the Jewish New Year. But the religious holiday is something even more important. In the Bible, it records that there are seven feasts of Jehovah. And the Bible says clearly that they belong to the Lord. And this one's called the Feast of Trumpets. And so we want to examine that and we want to see why it's important, not just for Israel, but as well for us. And so here's what it would look like in Israel. Matter of fact, you'll probably recognize if you've ever been there, this is called the Mount of Olives. And as you look at the Mount of Olives, you're looking across the Kidron Valley and you're looking right into the Temple Mount area. What a beautiful sight and what a beautiful picture this is. And listen as they celebrate the Feast of Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah. See what I mean? Happy time, the happy sound of, of the shofar. Well, what about Rosh Hashanah? What about the Feast of Trumpets? Why is it so important? There's at least four major passages that deals with this in the Bible. And you see, the thing that to me is so interesting is this. Every one of the seven Feasts of Jehovah, while they were instituted for Israel, they have a, a key part in the church. In other words, they foretold a picture a picture that is true in the church. Let me just give you a quick example, and we're gonna examine this a lot more later because this feast is going on right now. As this program is airing for the first time, this feast is going on right now. And its significance is extremely important. But let's take the feast of Passover. We know what that means to every Jewish family. It means that they were freed from slavery in Egypt. They were emancipated out of Egypt, but isn't it unique that the Lord Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 26 said this to his disciples that in two days will be the feast of pa pa Passover and the Son of Man must be crucified. And so we see how that there's a direct correlation between these seven feasts of Jehovah and action inside the church. And so what is it about this uh, feast of trumpets that is so important? Well, let's take a look at one of those passages. It's in Joel chapter 2. And here's what it says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm in my holy mountain, let all the habitations of the earth tremble, for the day of the Lord comes, for it is near at hand. And so here is uh, Rabbi Glick, and he's on the Mount of Olives, and he's actually the one that instituted the, the little serenade that we heard as we began our program this morning. But what is interesting is it talks about the fact that this is an indication that there's something near at hand. It was the gathering. The point of the Feast of Trumpets was the gathering of the people. The gathering of the people through introspection of their own lives, through repentance to God, and a time when, when God would come and meet them. And so he refers to it as a fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, verse 1. But as well, it's found in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24. It's found again in, in Exodus chapter 19. 
It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So there's a, a great biblical pattern of it throughout the entire Bible, both for Jews and for the church. But here's what I think is extremely interesting. If we were to examine the feast that's going on right now as, as this program is going on, here's what we would find. There was a, a, a poster created, and the poster said, Global Shofar Blowing Facing the Foundation Stone. And so Rabbi Glick said he was disappointed. Matter of fact, he, he lamented the fact because he really wanted this year's celebration to be held on the Temple Mount. Now, why is that so incredible? Well, here's why it is. Because right now, as we're talking, not only is the Feast of Trumpets going on, but the negotiations for who will control and who will be in charge of the Temple Mount is going on. Throughout our program for a number of months, we talked about the fact that, that Israel is God's time clock. Next, the hour hand might be Israel, but the minute hand is Jerusalem. The, the people that want to control Jerusalem, the, the list is long. It gets longer every day. And then the second hand is the Temple Mount. Why? Because we know that sacrifices will be restored there. And eventually, once they're restored, the Antichrist will stop those and require a, a worship of him. Now, it's interesting because until now, there's been no sacrifice on the Temple Mount. But the talk that is going around in Israel is how soon can they begin to do these sacrifices again? We'll address that today. But the poster said, join us as we, as we blow the shofar, facing the foundation stone. And then he talked about this. He said that, that really, he said, the sacred ground, I mean, this is Rabbi Glick saying, the sacred ground, regrettably due to political restrictions, Israeli authorities do not permit the sound of the shofar upon the sacred ground of Zion, the Temple Mount. Consequently, we'll resound the shofar atop the Mount of Olives. And so he said, that's why we're going to do, that's why we're going to be looking where we're looking. And then he goes on to talk about the fact that they had requested and they continue to request the fact that they need to be able to do this on the Temple Mount. It places the Temple Mount exactly where the Word of God places the Temple Mount. A special place. Matter of fact, every great sacrifice in the history of Israel has been done on the Temple Mount. I'm talking about Abraham offering up Isaac. I'm talking about David in the threshing floor of Ornan. I'm talking about the first temple and every temple rebuilt. And I'm talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, even on Passover, all on the Temple Mount, the sacred place that's in the middle of the city of Jerusalem. Well, there's another aspect of this that I want us to, to examine today, because you see the idea of the message of the shofar. What is the real message of it? And so don't be confused by the fact that it's both a Jewish holiday, a new year, the civil new year, but the fact that it also has religious significance. Matter of fact, one of the, the quotes is in Numbers chapter 29. I, I want to, again, I want to read that because it says, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a sacred occasion. You shall not work at your occupations. You shall observe it as a day when the shofar is sounded. That's in Numbers chapter 29, verse 1. But what is also interesting is this. They talk about the fact that during that no work time, it's a time for us to inspect ourselves, to repent toward God, because it's a time when God comes down and he meets the people coming up. Now, think about that action. And you'll see why that's so important as we get later on in the, the New Testament, particularly in the, in the book of 1 Corinthians. Here's something else that I think you'll find quite interesting. There's really three different sounds. When we played the clip, there were three different sounds. There's, there's a long, straight blast, usually three or four seconds, but the last one, it may last 10 or 15 seconds, and that's called the last trump. See, it's distinguishable. From the others. Then there's some, some three part broken blasts, kind of a toot toot toot. And the article that they put out with this particular thing that I'm quoting from, they talk about then there's another one, a very nine very short blasts, all in quick succession, almost like a machine gun fire. I'm sure you heard those as, as we played the clip. But what is also interesting is they say that anywhere from 90 to 100 blasts are made usually divided into three particular sections, 
But when you come to the final one, there's a long, loud blast, and this is called the last trump. And so these are all part of the serenade that goes on. It's all part of the Feast of Trumpets, and it's all used in, in bringing in the celebration of this new year. And so two holidays, one, the Jewish New Year, two, the religious ceremony, the Feast of Jehovah, the Feast of Trumpets. Now, that in itself makes it very important. Can you imagine how important New Year's is to us? We, we celebrate. You know what? You can hardly find a, a restaurant open. You can't find a business open. It's, it's a, a day of celebration. But can you imagine now putting on top of that an important religious celebration? Because you see, there were seven of these all outlined in the book of Leviticus chapter 23. Each one having a very important aspect for the Jewish community. But guess what? An important aspect for us as believers. Later, I'll, I'll present a handout that you'll be able to, to download and you'll be able to see the importance of each one of these. But I'm going to take another step because this is also taking place today. You see, right now, during this week, we have a, a great internal struggle going on. And the struggle it began really just a, a few weeks ago because on the screen I show you the picture of the president of Turkey with, with the prince of Saudi Arabia. Now, why is that so important? Well, at this moment, not only is the Feast of Trumpets going on, but there's a struggle for the ownership, or for, I'm going to say, the, the senior status on the Temple Mount. There's really five different nations that are all seeking some control of it. For a long time, it was Jordan. The Jordanians policed it. There were Jordanian police there. There, there were Jordanian police that, that would approve your, your walking up on the Temple Mount. But they, they have been, uh, I'm going to put it, say, in, in uh, disrespect a little bit because they're not doing the best job. There's been a lot of unrest. There's been a lot of disagreements. And so now Saudi Arabia has come. And Saudi Arabia, in the last month, I'm sure every listener here has seen the news because Saudi Arabia now is saying, hey, we're ready to make peace with Israel. Yeah. Matter of fact, part of that, wanting to make peace with Israel, has to do with the Temple Mount and even with the train that's going to be built that will go from Saudi Arabia all the way to Israel. But what are the other countries? Well, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Morocco, the Palestinian Authority, who has no country but wants control and a say-so on the Temple Mount, and even Turkey. That's why you see the president of Turkey here. Why is this so important? Well, this whole process began all the way back under, under Prime Minister Begin. It was going on with, with Yitzhak Rubin. And what is almost unbelievable right now, at this very moment, there are people in Saudi Arabia that are offering $100 billion, uh, with a B, $100 billion dollars, to have say so and to be the, the leading protector of the Temple Mount. Now, why would they want it? Why would this be so valuable? Well, if you go back again historically, Begin, Rabin, all said, you know what? It's not worth any price tag for them to say, we monitor, we control the Temple Mount because it's a Jewish sacred ground area. The temple was built there before. The sacrifice of Abraham was there before. The threats of order, that was there before. And so the, the Islamic site, al Mosque, yeah, it's important to Muslims, but it, it didn't have a historical factor like the Bible has for Abraham and Isaac and for David and for King Solomon's temple. And so they're saying, no, no amount of money is worth it. But recently we're watching that fade because people are saying, yeah, you know what? What if Saudi Arabia would give $100 billion? Oh, they, they would just control it like Jordan did. They would just police it like Jordan did. But what is incredible is to see how bad they want it. Why do they want it? Because you know what it would do? It would bring all three holy sites. I'm talking about Mecca, Medina, Alas Mosque, on the Temple Mount all under the control of Saudi Arabia. You know what? To me, it makes it seem like maybe the intention of a, of a, pay, a peace between Saudi Arabia and Israel is not as pure as it once appeared to be. What is their purpose? And maybe their purpose is to gain control of the Temple Mount. 
But here's what we know. We know that it's something that is so important that even if, look, take a look at this. This is an exchange back and forth. This is people putting pressure on Israel to, to bring about a Saudi Arabia, Israeli peace agreement. And if you'll notice all the way down to the bottom is the one particular I want you to look at. It said the U.S. official who managed and will manage the project in the future is Amos Hochstein, President Biden's senior advisor on infrastructure and energy. Incredible. Now we watched Mr. Hochstein as he made a, a gas deal with Lebanon. We've watched him at almost every important event that's taken place as he tries to bring peace between the Arabs and the Israelis. He's, he's a, a, a number one factor. You can see him, and I have, I have pictures of him seeking to, to be behind the scenes, but at the same time, bringing this to pass. Wow, you wanna know something? I believe we're looking at something that could indeed be a peace treaty that would bring together two factions that have been at odds for a long time. Hey, by the way, not only is he a, a prime mover, but maybe now you understand why the Biden administration is seeking so hard to make peace in the Middle East. You see, look at their legacy. Their legacy is one of destruction. Their, their legacy is almost irreparable. But if they could come up with a peace treaty in the Middle East that would involve the Temple Mount, they think they might have a trophy that could allow them to, to gain some ground as they try for re-election. Yeah. And we all know that probably President Biden really isn't the main man making decisions. Many wonder if maybe Amos Hochstein is not the person who's making many of the decisions, at least on foreign policy. But look at this. In case you think that this is just a, a side story, not at all. Matter of fact, again this week, here is, is Netanyahu, and he is also endorsing the railway that's going to bring pilgrims to the Third Temple. And he talks about the fact this is a link. What is interesting, in this article, he quotes from Kings 10.2. He talks about the Queen of Sheba. It says this, she arrived in Jerusalem with a very large uh, entree with camels bearing spices, a great quantity of gold and precious stones. She came to Solomon. She asked him all that she had in her mind. They're talking about, you know what? Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, is a place to worship. We welcome worshipers from, from every country. We've even had the Queen of Sheba. And so they're talking about this high-speed train. Already it has a foothold that's in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia announced that they're participating in this. It's going to connect many countries together, uh, Islamic countries, bringing everyone, all kinds of, of pilgrims to the Temple Mount because they recognize that this is indeed a place to pray. Well, this particular one also talks about the fact that we'll go from the Bengarian airport right straight to the Western Wall so people can land at the airport and go right to the, to the temple area. Isn't it interesting, so much talk about the temple? And so it says this, the link will realize a multi-year vision that will change the face of the Middle East and Israel and will affect the entire world. Its vision reshapes the face of our region and allows the dream to become reality. This is Netanyahu saying this. My friend, it looks to me like the idea of bringing about some kind of a peace treaty is, is on a rail just like the train, and it's going to take place. Is this the peace treaty that's referred to in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27? Where the Antichrist comes and the, the treaty's not working, he has to endorse it. And only when he endorses it is there really a time when Israel will accept all of its agreements. And they're given permission by, by some granting authority to begin sacrifices again. You see, Right now, they don't even have permission to, to blow the shofar on the Temple Mount. But oh my, they'd like to blow the shofar. They'd like to go a step further. They'd like to begin animal sacrifices. And the connection of that with the red heifer and the search for the ashes and the fact that some of the, the red heifers that are in Israel are approaching the three-year age that they can be barbecued and, and the ashes can be collected and can be used to purify the priesthood and begin sacrifices. What an exciting time. Now, Look at this, because will lab-grown meat be brought to the third temple as an animal sacrifice? 
If it wasn't enough of a headline, here's one more. You see, what is incredible is this, that the burnt sacrifices that are there, some people are saying, wow, cruelty to animals. And so they're actually talking about growing lab uh, meat to offer sacrifices. Unbelievable. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not excited about eating lab-grown meat. I know we played the clip and, and they could grow a steak in about a minute or two and a, a group of filet in three minutes. I, I, I'm not big on eating any, either one of those growing in a laboratory. I don't trust the, the tissue used. I don't trust the fat cells they use. Believe me, this is going to meet with some opposition because who knows what's in the fat cells? Who knows what's in the cells? How do we know it's a clean animal? And so on. The, the debate goes on and on. I have quite an article. This is it. You'll find it on our website if you want to download it. It's very interesting. But look at the controversy. How, all of it's swirling right now about who owns this sacred piece of ground. I say all this because I think there's something very important. I want to I want to refer to this and as I ask the question are you ready? I'm asking the question are you ready for the Lord's return? You see every feast of the feast of Jehovah had been fulfilled right on the date. In a book called The Future, can you really know it? A book I wrote several years ago. And in here I explain and talk about the feast of Jehovah. And so I'm going to have downloaded on the website about five or six pages that you can have and you can, you can study it for yourself. But what's interesting is this. The first of the Feast of Jehovah is the Feast of Passover. And it's really celebrated in Exodus chapter 12. But the first time it's fully explained is in Leviticus 23. But the first one took place in, in Exodus chapter 12. And then we know that 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 says, Christ is our Passover. I quoted earlier, Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus told his disciples that he was going to be crucified, he was going to be killed on the Passover. You know, he was the Lamb of God. He was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Isn't it interesting that the first feast of Jehovah for the Jews also has a counterpart in the church? It's the death of Jesus. And the second feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's explained in Exodus chapter 12. And it's the remembrance table. It's the communion table explained again in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. It talks about the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And by the way, fulfilled right on the day exactly as the Feast of Jehovah. Or how about the third one? It's called the Feast of First Fruits. It's explained in Exodus 23 and in Leviticus 23, and it has to do with resurrection. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 talks about Jesus being the first fruits. He came alive on exactly the day of the Feast of First Fruits, resurrection. So every one of these fulfillments for the church came exactly on the day of the Old Testament and the old economy, the Jewish Feast of Jehovah, Pentecost. Lest you think we're talking about an accident. But isn't it interesting that in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, exactly 50 days later, after, after the crucifixion of Christ, 50 days later, the church was born. It was formed. And how interesting, because on the day of Pentecost, there was a special feast for, of Jehovah for the Jews, but a special time for the church it was formed. It began its formulation. And then there's the longest interval. Think about the formation of the church back in the first century. And now we come to the next one. The fifth one is the Feast of Trumpets. And it's explained in Leviticus 23, but the, the real example of it is found in Numbers chapter 19 or Exodus chapter 19. I'm going to go back there this morning. I want to read it to you because I think when you hear it read, you're going to say, wow. Are we watching something that's pretty spectacular? And so in Exodus chapter 19, it says in verse 9, The Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud. And so he begins to talk to Moses. He said, Be ready on the third day to come up. And many of the feast of the trumpets last a three-day period. And then he says this. He said, When you hear the trumpet sound, he says this, 
I'm going to come down to the cloud. And Moses, I want you to come up. And then he says, the voice of the trumpet talking exceedingly loud. And then he'll say, the trumpet sounds exceedingly long. And so it says, and the Lord descended in a smoke or a cloud in fire upon the mountain top. And the Lord came down on Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses up to the top and Moses went up. And there was the incredible time when the trumpet sounded long. The Lord coming down to the clouds, Moses going up to the clouds. My friend, what a picture of what it says in Thessalonians chapter 4. That the Lord's going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel. And in the clouds, those that are Christians, those that are believers are going to come up to meet him. I, I think it even goes a step further. I'm going to read you another passage. This one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What an exciting passage because here it says this. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, at the last trump, the trump shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The last trump. What is he talking about? Well, some have said maybe it's the, the last trump of, of Revelation where the trump judgments are sounded upon the earth. Remember, there were, there were seven of these trumpets, and then there were seven seals that were initiating them, and there were seven vials poured out. But I don't think so, because you see, Revelation talking about the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet, that wasn't written until about 95 or 96 AD. And 1 Corinthians, this passage is probably in 55 AD. Why, why, would, why would Paul be quoting from something that wasn't going to be written for 40 years? No, I think the last trump here is talking about the picture of the Feast of Trumpets. That's the last trumpet. We're, we're not waiting for that period of time inside the, the tribulation. Listen, my friend, before the tribulation ever begins, Revelation chapter 4 the trumpet sounds and we go up to meet Jesus. And so this trump is referring to the Feast of Trumpets. What an exciting time. My friend, do you realize that right now in Israel, they're celebrating the Feast of Trumpets. We could, we could be called up to heaven right now and it would fulfill the Israeli picture, the Jewish picture of the Feast of Trumpets. I'm not predicting it's gonna be this day, Here's what I say, whenever the Lord sounds the trumpet, it will fulfill the Feast of Trumpets. But how exciting to see the whole world looking at the Temple Mount. Saudi Arabia offering hundred billion dollars to control the Temple Mount. People wanting to begin animal sacrifices. And what a time, because you know what? Everything is in, in proper perspective for the Lord to come and call his church home. Here's my question, are you ready? If that trumpet sounds today, if that trumpet sounds to no, tomorrow, are you ready? Do you know Christ is your Savior? My friend, don't wait. The trumpet could really sound at any time, not just for the Feast of Trumpets. The trumpet could sound at any time. And God's going to call those who have accepted His Son as their Savior up to be with Him in the clouds. My friend, what a time for you to say, you know what, I know I'm a sinner. I, I know I've broken fellowship with God, with the Holy God. But I also know that Jesus Christ went to the cross, died on the cross, shed his blood, was buried and rose again for me. He was my savior. He's my substitute. And this day I take him as my savior. My friend, then you're ready if the trumpet sounds today. Because one of these days, the trumpet will sound. The last trump will be a time when those who have accepted Christ will go to meet Jesus in the air, in the clouds. And then the Antichrist will come. He'll stop a sacrifice. Yeah, he'll come and, and begin all the, the events of the tribulation will take place. My friend, don't, you don't have to go through those. Because Jesus bore your sin, provided salvation for you. My friend, what a chance for you to get ready for the Feast of Trumpets. What a chance for you to get ready to meet the Lord Jesus. I look around at the world. Every event says this. We're near to the time when Jesus is going to come back. I'm asking you, have you ever made sure that you receive Christ as your Savior? Do you have friends that you need to tell about it? 
What a day as we celebrate Rosh Hashanah, the new year, as we celebrate the Feast of Trumpets. Are you ready? If this is the day that the trumpet of Jesus sounds and those that are Christians go to meet him, I hope to see you there. Thank you for watching.